I think that all of us have a, a desire to be used by God in some way, right? All of us want to create an impact in the world around us. We want to find a sense of, of belonging. We want to make a difference, right? We want to make a difference for God's kingdom and, and the places that are around us every day, whether that's our neighborhoods, whether that's our household, whether that's our workplaces. And I love chatting with people about this going, hey, what is God calling you to? What are you dreaming about doing for God in these areas of your life? And I find the more I chat with people about this, the more I find that there's a big difference between what people say they want to do and what people feel they can do, right? It's a, very, it's a very different thing. I think in a lot of ways, we all have a little bit of imposter syndrome when it comes to our faith journey, right? We often feel like we're not good enough. We often feel like we're not spiritual enough. We often feel like we're not educated enough to do something meaningful for God, right? We ask ourselves questions like, how, how can I teach when I'm not confident in my knowledge, how can I lead others when I'm still working on myself? Why would God choose me when there's so many people who are better qualified and better equipped to do it? Or even if we feel like we can do something for God, we feel like maybe we have the ability to do something, we often feel that we've disqualified ourselves because of our sin. And we walk around carrying our guilt and our shame. How can I help somebody when my marriage is struggling? How can I teach someone about God when I'm still doubting? How can I teach someone to be more like Jesus when I'm still addicted to pornography? How can God use me? And why would he even want to? Maybe you're here today and you're not a believer. You're still exploring Christianity. And you might be asking similar questions a little different, right? Am I good enough to be used by God? Does God want me to be involved? Can God use me while I'm still learning and figuring out this whole thing? And so today I want to unpack this idea. Can God use me? And by the end of this message, I want you to know and I want you to believe that God can use you no matter your abilities, no matter your gifts, no matter your talents, and no matter the messiness of your life. And to do this, we're going to look at the story of Ehud, the left-handed assassin from the book of Judges. If we look at the Bible and we compare it to a summer blockbuster, then I think the book of Judges has to be the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It's a series of interconnected stories taking place in different locales where the, the events of one story impact the events of the next one, right? There's heroes and there's battles. There's characters you know and love, and there's others that you've never heard of before. And there's enemies and armies who appear again and again and are defeated by these different heroes. And over the next three weeks, we're going to find ourselves in a bit of a mini-series within our summer blockbuster series. A Judges trilogy, a Judges cinematic universe, if you will. And the main body of Judges runs from Judges chapter 3 all the way to Judges chapter 16. It's broken up into six major sections, and each follows one of the major Judges. We have the first two, which is Othniel and Ehud, who we're going to be talking about today. Then there's Deborah, uh, there's Gideon, who's going to be a part of one of our upcoming messages. There's Jephthah, and then there's Samson, and Samson will round out our Judges trilogy. There's also a number of short pieces on what we call the minor judges, Shamgar, Tola, Jer, Ibsen, Elon, and Abdon, and generally these guys get one to two verses of all their exploits. So let's talk a little bit of the context of Judges. Where and when does this book occur? Right, it comes after Joshua, both literally within the Bible after the book, but it also comes after the time of Joshua's leadership over the people of Israel. That means the Israelites have gone into Egypt, been in captivity there. They've left under the leadership of Moses. They've wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and they finally come back to the promised land uh, where Joshua has led them in this partial conquest. And we read in Judges 2, 1 through 5, that the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land I swore to give your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars. Yet you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? And I have also said, I will not drive them out before you. They will become traps for you, and their gods will become snares to you. 
And when the angel of the Lord has spoken these things to all the Israelites, the people wept aloud. And they called that place Bochim. There they offered sacrifices to the Lord. And so the Israelites did not drive out the Canaanites from the land as God has instructed. They grew apathetic and they remained in this state of partial completion of God's will for them in that land. As we move further into Judges, we read in Judges 2, 10 and 11, after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, right? After that whole generation had passed away, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and they served the Baals. And if you remember just a few weeks ago, Dave shared about Elijah and his showdown with the priests of Baal. Right? And so the Israelites are, are serving these other gods. Continues in Judges 3, 5 to 6, the Israelites lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. They took their daughters in marriage and they gave their own daughters to their sons and they served their gods. And when we come out of the book of Judges, we head into the time of Samuel and Saul and the establishment of the kings over Israel and in fact, the, the book of Judges ends, uh, Judges 21, it says, in those days Israel had no king and everyone did as they saw fit. Right, and so we leave the book of Judges looking ahead to a king, looking ahead to a ruler, a king that ultimately points us towards Jesus. And, but we sit here in the book of Judges in this in-between time, right? We're after the conquest of the land in Joshua, but we're before a complete victory, we're sitting in a time where we need a deliverer from oppression, but we're still awaiting a king who will reign forever. That's the tension of this moment. In 1949, a man by the name of Joseph Campbell published a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And Joseph Campbell's work outlines this idea of the hero's journey, or he calls it in his book the monomyth. Right? It's this idea that all great stories follow the exact same pattern, or at least a similar pattern. You can identify these elements, and when you see them, it helps you to better understand what's going on in the story. And he kind of draws this from a lot of different ideas. He said, oh, it applies to ancient myths, from Homer's Odyssey to new movies to everything, right? And it largely gained influence uh, after it was credited by George Lucas as being influential in the creation of a little movie called Star Wars. Right, it helps us to understand. And so the, the eight or the seven step story of his monomyth are this. We start in the ordinary world. Then there's a, a call to adventure. There's the refusal of the call. There's a meeting with a mentor. There's cross, crossing the threshold. There's the ordeal and then the return. Uh, to draw an example of the monomyth, to just give a little context, and this is spoilers for Star Wars from 1977. We start in the ordinary world. Luke lives on Tatooine with his aunt and his uncle on this farm. There's the call to adventure when he gets a message from Princess Leia through R2-D2. There's the refusal of the call where he's not really thrilled about having to leave his home planet. There's the meeting with a mentor where he meets with Obi-Wan Kenobi and is shown his father's lightsaber. There's the crossing of the threshold where Luke and Obi-Wan leave Mos Eisley and the Millennium Falcon and they head off to Alderaan. There's the ordeal where they rescue Leia from the Death Star and ultimately Luke uses the Force to uh, destroy the Death Star. And then there's the return where Luke joins the rebellion and decides to become a Jedi, establishing this new normal, right? This, this new sense of the regular world. And so when we have these story elements, it helps us understand other stories. You can probably think of some of your favorite books, some of your favorite novels, some of your favorite movies, and see those elements and see how that framework helps you understand what's coming up. The book of Judges, very similarly to the hero's journey, has a framework, right? It has a pattern that helps us understand it, and it's composed of these components. Number one, Israel does evil in the eyes of Yahweh. Number two, Yahweh gives or sells them into the hands of oppressors. Number three, Israel serves the oppressor for a number of years. Number four, Israel cries out to Yahweh. Number five, Yahweh raises up a deliverer or a judge. Uh, number six, the spirit of Yahweh comes upon the deliverer. Number seven, the oppressor is subdued. And number eight, the land has rest, or some translations use the word peace, for a number of years. 
So that's the, the cycle of judges, right? The pattern of judges. And for a, a brief example of this, we're going to look at Othniel. He's the first of the major judges, and he kind of is the example of this framework that all the other judges build off of. It says in Judges 3, uh, 7, it says, The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, and they served the Baals and the Asherahs. That's step one. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel, so he sold them into the hands of Cushan, Rishathaim, king of Aram, Naharim. That's step two. To whom the Israelites were subject for eight years. Step three. But when they cried out to the Lord, step four, he raised up a deliverer, Othniel, son of Kenaz, who was Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. That's step five. The spirit of the Lord came on him, so he became Israel's judge and went to war. Step six. And the Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim, king of Aram, into the hands of Othniel, who overpowered him. Step seven. And the land had peace for 40 years. Step eight. Until Othniel, son of Kenaz, died. And so you can look for this narrative framework in every judge that we read about in this book. We often refer to it as the cycle of judges because it's a pattern that just repeats over and over and over again. And so over the next three weeks, as we're in this Judges mini-series, I hope that this framework helps you understand all of the stories we'll be looking at, both Gideon, Samson, and Ehud today. And so now that we've laid all that groundwork on the history of Judges, the where, the when, the why, the pattern, let's talk about Ehud. If you don't know Ehud, it's okay. He's a bit of a minor character. He's not super notable, but... I remember him quite fondly from the pages of every teen guy adventure Bible that I was given as a kid, right? If you caught our kids moment earlier in the service, you'll hopefully remember that like in the story of Othniel, the people of Israel has, have turned their backs on God. And for 18 years, they serve Eglon, the king of Moab. And when the Israelites cry out for God, to God, he raises up this new deliverer not a warrior of the tribe of Judah like Othniel, but this left-handed Benjaminite diplomat responsible for delivering tribute to the king. Ehud crafts a sword, he straps it to his right thigh, and after delivering the tribute, he assassinates the king before escaping and leading the Israelites to victory over Moab, establishing peace for a period of about 80 years. Now, I'm not sure why I really love the story of Ehud. It, might be like Ehud, my wife is left-handed, and there's been a few times I'm sure she's wanted to stab me. It might also be that, as a teenage boy, a story of violent assassination, military action, and the occasional poop joke was kind of perfectly targeted to me. And even though this story sometimes feels a little uncomfortable, it sometimes feels a little gross, it sometimes feels a little out of place in our Bibles, there's actually a lot that we can learn in this story about how God is at work in Israel's history, and about how God is at work with us today. And so we'll pick up with Ehud in Judges chapter 3. You can feel free to follow along in your Bible or Bible app or just on the screen behind me. It says in verse 12, Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And because they did this evil, the Lord gave Eglon, the king of Moab, power over Israel, getting the Ammonites and the Amalekites to join him. Eglon came and attacked Israel and took possession of the city of Palms. The Israelites were subject to Eglon, king of Moab, for 18 years. Again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and he gave them a deliverer, Ehud, a left-handed man, the son of Gera the Benjaminite. And the Israelites sent with him with tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. And so this cycle of judges begins. Right? The Israelites do evil in the eyes of God, and so he gives power over them to Eglon, the king of Moab, and the Moabites in this story join forces with two other groups, the Ammonites and the Amalekites, and all together they come against Israel. They take over the city of Palms, which is Jericho, and they're undoing the work that the Israelites have done in taking over this land. Right? They're undoing what God has already commanded them to do, and so as the people cry out, God raises up this new judge, a new deliverer for the people in Ehud. Right, he's a diplomat, he delivers the tribute, and it's important to note in the story that Ehud is left-handed. Now, why is that important to know? Well, in this context, it means that Ehud doesn't arouse any suspicion. 
right? Through much of history, left-handed people have had a bit of bad press, and left-handed people at this time weren't considered a military threat at all. And while the negative press we have for things that are left is mostly gone today, there's still some remnants, right? We have most products designed for right-handed people. If someone's clumsy, we go, oh, they've got two left feet, not two right feet. In the Bible, the positive thing is to be sitting at the right hand of God, not the left, because the right is preferred. We continue the story in verse 16. It says, Now Ehud had made a double-edged sword about a cubit, which is about 18 inches long, which he strapped to his right thigh under his clothing. Now there's some interesting details about this sword that differ greatly from what most of us picture when we think of a sword. I think most of us probably picture, you know, like King Arthur, Excalibur, this big, long, straight, double-edged, gleaming steel sword shining in the light as somebody rides a horse. But this story takes place during the Bronze Age. And so a little audience participation question here. During the Bronze Age, most swords were made of bronze, yes. Bronze, really different than steel, right? Bronze is a much softer metal. And so it's often cast into heavier shapes because it needed the support. And so most swords at the time were sickle swords, meaning they had a bit of a curve to them, and they'd have one sharpened edge that was thin for cutting and then a much thicker back edge because that was how it would maintain the structural integrity of the blade. Ehud's weapon, very different than a typical sword of this period, right? He has made a thin, double-edged sword. This is not a sword that's designed for battle. This is not a sword designed for prolonged or multiple uses in, in, you know, in a field. This is a sword designed for one-time use. It's designed for this mission. We continue in verse 17. It says, He presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab, who was a very fat man, and after Ehud had presented the tribute, he sent on their way those who had carried it. But on reaching the stone images near Gilgal, he himself went back to Eglon and said, Your majesty, I have a secret message for you. And the king said to his attendants, Leave us. And they all left. Right? Ehud is not just an ordinary man. He's actually considered disadvantaged. Right? Othniel, who's the first judge we read about briefly earlier in the sermon, he was a warrior from the tribe of Judah. He was a legacy in relation to Caleb, who's one of the, the great military commanders in Joshua. Right? Othniel is the obvious choice for a deliverer for the people. Ehud? He's a left-handed Benjaminite. Right? He's le left-handed, it's the opposite of how most warriors fought, so he likely wasn't even trained in combat. Some scholars and commentators believe Ehud might have actually had a deformity on his right arm or actually not even had a right hand and only had his left. And so when he comes back to see the king, not only do they not check him for weapons, but the king sends his attendants away so that they're fully alone. Right? Ehud is so underestimated that he has the opportunity to take on the king. And so Ehud is, is a surprising choice in a society that's even more cruel than our own to people who are physically handicapped. He would have been considered ineffective. No one would have looked to Ehud to be their leader. No one would have wanted to follow this guy, but he is who God chooses. And just like in the day of, of Judges, God is still using ordinary men and women who want to be used by him to accomplish his great purposes. Right? God can use you if you want to be used. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29, says, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. Right? God is moving and he is at work every day through ordinary people. He doesn't need us to be strong. He doesn't need us to be perfect. He doesn't need us to be equipped. He doesn't need us to be experts or to be influential in the world. All God needs is ordinary people who are willing to serve him. We continue the story in, in verse 20. It says, 
Ehud then approached him while he was sitting alone in the upper room of his palace. And he said, I have a message from God for you. As the king rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand. He drew the sword from his right thigh and he plunged it into the king's belly. Even the handle sank in after the blade and his bowels discharged. And Ehud did not pull the sword out and the fat closed in over it. Then Ehud went out on the porch. He shut the doors of the upper room behind him and he locked them. And so Ehud goes right up to the king takes his left hand, draws the sword, plunges it into into Eglon, and at around 18 inches, the sword is completely swallowed up by the mass of this man. His bowels discharge, and then Ehud makes this daring escape. And Now, I mentioned kind of earlier, we were talking about movies. The book of Judges often feels like an action movie, right? There's military combat, there's violence, there's fighting. But this story, and maybe we don't see it in the English translation as much, is actually an action comedy. And sometimes we take the Bible so seriously that we actually miss out on the sections of humor that are in it. That's not to say we shouldn't take the Bible seriously. No, we believe, like it says in 1 Timothy, that all scripture is breathed out by God and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. But but when we take the Bible so seriously, so literally, we often miss out on some of the depth that comes from its different genres, right? This is a book that's full of history, It's a book that's full of teaching, but it's also full of songs and poetry and apocalyptic visions. And and as of today, and as of the story today, it's also full of humor, right? We need to read and understand it within the genre to actually understand why this story is written. We have to strip away our 21st century vision, take off our Nikes, take off our Crocs, put on some Israelite sandals, and look at it in the proper framing. Right, remember the Israelites who have heard this story, they've been oppressed and taxed to the bone for over 18 years by Eglon. And within this framework, it's not a, a dirty story, it's not a dark story that we need to avoid, but it's, it's actually a story we should enjoy. It's an underdog story, it's full of biting satire and humorous and laugh out loud moments. Right, in Judges, uh, verse 24, it says, after he, Ehud, had gone, The servants came and found the doors of the room locked. They said he, Eglon, must be relieving himself in the inner room of the palace. And they waited to the point of embarrassment. When he did not open the doors of the room, they took a key and unlocked them. And there they saw their Lord fallen on the floor, dead. Now that maybe doesn't seem like a super humorous story, but we miss some of the emphasis that comes in this. There's a Hebrew particle, it's hine. It appears three times in these verses, and every Bible translation translates the word a little bit differently. Uh, A lot of traditional English translations or older English translations go with behold. The NIV that we're reading from does a good job, but it misses a little bit of the, the emphasis that's supposed to come with this word, right? This is supposed to indicate something shocking. This is supposed to indicate something surprising, and we need to read that emphasis into it to kind of see the humor in this. All right, so let's try reading again with a little bit more of that emphasis. So they looked, why? The doors of the upper chamber were locked. And so they said, no, he's surely covering his feet in the bathroom. Translation, his pants are around his ankles if he didn't get that one. And so they went to the point of shame and still, still, he's not opening the doors. Dude has been in there a long time. Like it's an uncomfortable wait And so finally they go and they get the key and they open the doors and there he was, surprise, he's dead. As one commentator puts it, any red-blooded Israelite would surely find this funny. They'd be amusing, right? Eglon's lackeys think he's using the facilities, so they dally and they dally and they're outside the door just pacing, checking their watches, going like, what is going on with this guy? Right, all the meanwhile, Ehud is going, making a splendid escape. I like to picture him parkouring across the rooftops like in a James Bond movie, but finally they get the nerve to unlock the door, and they open it up, and there's this massive bulk of their king laying on the floor. When we read this story with Israelite goggles, we can't help but see the satire and the humor. Right, the way the Israelites told or heard about this episode shows they're not embarrassed about it. Instead, it's a story they enjoyed telling. 
That's why it's written with humor, or at least bits of humor within it. I'm going to share one more joke from this story because nothing's funnier than a guy explaining a joke to a whole room full of people, but Eglon's name literally translates to baby cow. Calf, right? Meaning Eglon is the fattened calf slaughtered as the people celebrate their freedom from oppression. When we miss out on this humor, we often grimace at the explicit detail. Right, we're uncomfortable with this story because it feels dark, it feels dirty, it feels a little gross. There's, there's blood and there's gore and there's violence and there's poop in the story. And we're, we're like, no, I don't want to deal with that. We try and whitewash it. Right, we try to make this story clean. We polish it up so that it fits on the white pages and the gold edges of our Bibles. Right, we want this story to be palatable for us. Oftentimes to do that, we'll allegorize the, the meaning of the story. We're like, oh man, this is, story is about... God's word is a sword, sharp. Or we make this story about all oh, the dangers of being alone with an enemy, and somehow we've made Eglon the character that we relate to as the hero. But it's not a story that we have to clean up. Right? God is not afraid of our humanness. He's not afraid of our mess. He's not afraid of humor. He's not afraid of violence. He's not afraid of the blood and the guts and the poop. God is not afraid to be moving and active in messy situations. And so when we read a story like this and we, we feel the need to clean it up, we feel the need to, we feel uncomfortable with it, we want to polish it to make it pretty, it's because we think that it's unbecoming of God to be involved in messy situations. Right? We think it's unbecoming of God to be involved in a messy situation. And when we think that way, then we often think that same way about ourselves. We think we need to clean ourselves up. We have to make ourselves presentable so that God can meet us. We want to be presentable so that God can use us. But the book of Judges and the Bible as a whole is full of stories of God moving through messy people in messy situations. Right? Adam ate of the tree in the garden. Noah got drunk. Abraham lied about his wife. Jacob cheated his brother out of an inheritance. Moses murdered an Egyptian. Rahab was a prostitute. David cheated on a married, with a married woman and then had her husband killed. Jonah fled from God's plan. Thomas doubted. Peter denied Jesus. Paul persecuted and murdered Christians. And Ehud was an assassin. And yet God is at work in all of them. They didn't have to clean themselves up before God encountered them. They didn't need to, to make themselves more palatable for God. They didn't need to make themselves more presentable for God. He met them where they were at. And so don't doubt that God can work through you and through whatever mess and whatever situations and whatever sin is in your life. The story continues in, in verse 26. It says, while they waited, Ehud got away. He passed by the stone images and escaped to Syrah. When he arrived there, he blew a trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went down with him from the hills, with him leading them. Follow me, he ordered, for the Lord has given Moab, your enemy, into your hands. So they followed him down, and they took possession of the fords of the Jordan that led to Moab, and they allowed no one to cross over. At that time, they struck down about 10,000 Moabites, all vigorous and strong. Not one escaped. That day Moab was made subject to Israel, and the land had peace for 80 years. And so in this moment, the, the cycle, the pattern of judges is fulfilled. We've come full circle, right? God has delivered the people from oppression. They've come back to this moment of, of repentance. They're now free from their oppression again. They've returned to normal. But like I said, this is a repeating pattern. We see again and again in Judges. And so we read in Judges 4 verse 1 that again the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord now that Ehud was dead. And it's this idea that repeats over and over. right? Every time God raises up a judge, every time God raises up a deliverer, the people once again turn on him. There's freedom from enemies. There's this renewed sense of godly living. There's this salvation idea of restoration for the people, but it never lasts. Maybe it's 40 years. Maybe it's 80, but it doesn't last, right? And so the story of Ehud very quickly moves away from this humorous, victorious moment to this really sad place. 
the people do evil in the eyes of the Lord. Right? Ehud is not an adequate savior. Yes, he brings freedom. Yes, he brings relief. Yes, he brings peace. But he can't change the hearts of the people. Right? Hearts that consistently are turning away from God. He cannot free the people from their sins. There's a need for a greater savior. For a greater deliverer. One who doesn't use deception like Ehud or need assistance like Deborah or display selfish ambition like Gideon or rashness like Jephthah or sexual weakness like Samson. We need Jesus, the only good and perfect judge. Right, and while the tragedy of the story of Ehud is that the Israelites eventually turn their back on God, there's a potential tragedy for all of us as we read the story. And the tragic moment for us is if we don't call out to the deliverer that we have in Jesus, that we will not be changed because of what Jesus has done. I'll invite the, the worship team to come as we close out our service, but I just want to end with this. Jesus has come, he's lived a perfect life, he's died on the cross, he's defeated death in rising from the grave, he's defeated our ultimate enemy, sin, and we have the opportunity to turn to him in repentance. Not just repentance for a generation, but repentance for all of eternity. And if you haven't put your trust in Jesus to be that deliverer, I invite you today to do that. If you're already a believer, but your lifestyle like the Israelites is reflective of someone saying in name they serve a God, but your life is pursuing idols, pursuing other gods, then today you have a chance to repent and turn away from those idols that you're pursuing and come back to God. Right, to turn over and come to the one deliverer that we have in Jesus. God can move through any of us, no matter our infirmities, our disabilities, our weaknesses, no matter our sin, no matter our guilt and shame, no matter the messiness of our lives, because Jesus has delivered us forever. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you have come. We thank you that you have lived a perfect life and that you have died for us. Thank you that you have created a way for us to be free from our sins, to be free from the death that we deserved. I pray that all of us in this room would be encouraged that you work through us no matter our qualifications. Help us to be rid of the guilt and the shame that so often holds us back. And God, help us to trust in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, to be people of impact with our friends, our family, our neighbors, our coworkers. God, we ask that all of us would be people who are used by you. And we ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.